Today's guest is Barbara Aerosmith Young. So when Barbara was a little girl in the late 1950s, she was told that she had a brain block and that there was nothing she could do about it. And she suffered from multiple learning disabilities and eventually got, went on a quest in her life to study psychology and child development. And eventually in the 1970s, she caught wind of a concept of neuroplasticity. And from there, she truly changed the way her brain functioned completely. Uh, she has a TED talk on this that at the time of recording has 2.4 million views on it. It's very powerful. Um, we'll link that in the show notes so you can check it out. Uh, but you'll get to hear a lot of her story here and some of the things that have happened since then in her professional career. Um, her book is called The Woman Who Changed Her Brain. We'll link that up as well. It's in seven languages. And um, she's also the founder of the Aerosmith program. So lots of programs being used in all sorts of applications from schools to privately to um, she mentions a study they're doing with a rehab center in Australia on addiction. Um, I asked her about autism. I asked her all sorts of things. Um, she is absolutely wonderful. Um, this is such an inspiring interview for anybody to listen to um, in terms of understanding that you have the capability to change how your brain operates. I love the concept of neuroplasticity. It's so um, intertwined in the work that I do on the daily. And Barbara is such a powerful example of just how important it is. So um, yeah, I'm excited for you guys to get to listen. Here is Barbara Aerosmith Young. Okay. So Barbara, I'm so honored to have you on the show. Like you are such a pioneer in neuroplasticity. And when I say that, I mean for yourself, like you learned about the brain and how to change it for yourself. And I think that is the most, mm, the greatest gift that we have to share with others. So I was wondering if you could share at first uh, your background and how you came into this field. Uh, absolutely. Well, I, I feel like, you know, if one believes in destiny or fate, um, and I do believe also in free will, but I think my my life, everything in my life conspired for me to create the work that I, mm -hmm. I created. Um, I, I was born with significant learning difficulties, and this was in a time when they hadn't even diagnosed or didn't have a concept of a learning disability. So when I started my schooling, I was identified as slow. Uh, I was identified as difficult, um, you know, all those lovely labels uh, and the boxes that I got put in. Uh, I got the strap in grade one. I mean, because at that time, this was in the 1950s, they still used the strap. And I think, you wow. know, I I have compassion for my grade one teacher because she she had not met somebody like me um, mm -hmm. who just didn't learn like other children. And I reversed everything. And, you know, if you gave me numbers to add, I'd add them upside down and backwards and, you know, left to right mm -hmm. or right to left. Um, and, you know, for me, it was clear that, you know, I could look at the other children in the class and realize there was something not working for me because they were all you know, picking up reading, picking up writing, picking up numbers, and I wasn't. Um, and I remember in grade one hearing that my teacher talk to my mother and basically say, don't have high expectations for your daughter. Uh, she is going to always struggle and she won't really be successful or amount to much. And wow. I feel like I was given a life sentence in, in mm. grade one. And I, I do believe one thing that my teacher said that my educational career would be a struggle, which was accurate, but I, I do believe I did amount to something in, in my <laughs> life. So I think I think I proved her wrong there. But I, I feel, you know, that was the beginning of my journey, you know, and I developed all those techniques that children develop to avoid work. You know, I I put the thermometer on the light bulb to get a temperature so I could stay at home. And I made sure that the temperature wasn't so high that I'd have to go to the hospital. You know, it was just the right amount that my mother would uh, keep me home. I, you know, would put up my hand and go to the washroom and spend an hour in the washroom, you know, just all, all those avoidance techniques because mm -hmm. learning was, was incredibly um, challenging. And, you know, I was really lucky in the parents that I had. My mother was an educator, so she was determined that I would learn how to read and write. So I would come home at lunch and get flashcards. I'd come home after school and get flashcards. And I didn't appreciate it at the time. Time, but it did work. I learned how to read. I learned how to write. I learned basic numeracy, but it didn't address the underlying learning difficulty that I had. It just, you know, gave me some skills that that you know I could show up and and function in classroom. And my father was a scientist and an inventor, and he had this belief. He said that if there's 
a problem in the world and there's no solution currently, he said, it's your responsibility to hunt for a solution and see if you can come up with a solution. And then he said something that I've held dear to my heart. He said, if the world, the rest of the world tells you you can't do it, he said, don't listen. Don't listen to conventional wisdom. He said, this is how science goes forward. So, you know, I feel like I was set out on a quest, <clears throat> excuse me, very early on to try to find a solution to my learning difficulties um, and had no idea how I was going to do that. But that that belief system was set up early on. So, you know, all of my schooling was a struggle. I, um, you know, and, and in grade eight uh, in my schooling, that's the year before you go to high school. Um, and it had been such a struggle, I thought, how can I cope with high school where now you've got multiple subjects, you have to find your locker. And I had a spatial problem. So I got lost all the time. Mm. And, you know, sadly feeling desperate, I attempted to end my life at that point. Um, and it was a mixed blessing. The learning difficulty I had was such that I didn't really understand things. So I didn't understand how one went about and did that. And clearly I wasn't successful and I'm very glad that I, I wasn't, mm -hmm. but it pointed to, you know, the degree of despair and pain that, mm -hmm. that, that I felt because I really felt, you know, I didn't fit in. I didn't fit in academically. I didn't fit in socially because I, I didn't really understand people and mm -hmm. I wasn't good athletically. I had a, a difficulty in the part of my brain that, that understands spatial relations. So, you know, on sports, I, I was not the person that you wanted on your sports team. Mm. Um, but, you know, I was dogged and persistent. And so I, I kept putting one foot in front of the other. And it wasn't until I got to, you know, I finished school. Uh, I went to university to study child development because I wanted to understand <laughs> what was not working in my development. Um, mm -hmm. And then I went into school psychology to do my master's again, trying to understand, you know, what was, you know, not working for me. And it was in graduate school, somebody handed me a book that changed my life. It was called The Man with a Shattered World. And it was written by a Russian neuropsychologist, Alexander Luria. And it, it, it really, it, it changed my life. So I dedicated my work to Luria or my book to Luria because it was the beginning of realizing that the source of my problem was my brain, because this was a story of a soldier who in World War II in Russia had a very localized wound in his brain. And he was keeping a journal talking about what he could no longer do. I was keeping a journal, you know, 20 years later, you know, halfway around the world. And we were describing exactly the same problem. So now I knew part of my brain wasn't working. I knew I didn't have shrapnel in my brain, but for some reason it, it hadn't worked. Um, which now we know learning difficulties have their source and cognitive functions that aren't that are underperforming. Um, and to solve a problem, you have to understand its nature. So this was my aha moment. OK, it's my brain. And then I went in and read many more books by Lurie and understood I had multiple parts of my brain <laughs> that that were underperforming. And then at the same time, I read a, a, an article uh, um, psychologist at Berkeley who was looking at neuroplasticity, you know, this concept that our brains can change. Now he was studying rats, but I figured if rats brains could change, sur surely human brains could change. Mm -hmm. And I thought, you know what, I have to go out and see if I can create a, an exercise or a program that will stimulate my brain and change it. And I had to create three different programs because I had three different areas, very different that weren't working. Um, and, you know, I went to all my professors at that point because I was in graduate school and said, hey, I think I understand what's what my struggles are. And I think I've got a way that I can address it. And they all said at that time, because this was 1978, they said learning difficulties have nothing to do with the brain. That was a belief <laughs> at the time. And they said, even if they do, they said, your brain is fixed. Like at your age, you know, because I was, what, 25 or 26, right. my brain is fixed and there is no neuroplasticity. And I remembered what my father said. He said, go out and try. He said, don't listen. If the world tells you, mm. you can do it. So I had no idea if it was going to work. And I, I created three different, very different programs. And I talk about it in my book, The Woman Who Changed Her Brain. And sure enough, I was proof of human neuroplasticity because after going through this work, I could do things that with the best will in the world before 
I could never do. I mean, I could understand things. I could listen to conversations and understand as people were talking. I'd never been able to do that. Um, I couldn't have this conversation. I, I would have to, if you asked me a question, I would memorize the question. I go away and think about it for two hours and then I come back, but you'd gone off to something else, right? You hadn't waited for me. Um, mm. So first time in my life, I was part of human discourse, which was profound. I could engage with wow. people socially. I could read a book and instead of having to read a page a hundred times to try to understand it, I could read it once and then I could read the next page. Like it was so much more efficient. Um, and the other thing that I'd never thought about was, um, you know, my, I, I suffered from depression and anxiety because of the learning difficulties. And it felt like my very fractured psyche and sense of self started to integrate because every night as I went to sleep, I have a very strong visual memory and I would play scenes from age four and five and six. And all of a sudden it was, I get it now. I understand why that person did that. I understand why wow. this happened. And it was so profound. And so to wow. me, it just impressed me that this incredibly amazing organ we have our brain, you know, it, it's not just reading, writing and arithmetic. It, it understands our world. It understands ourself. It understands other people. And when I saw those results, I thought I have to take this work out into the world and help other people. And that was the beginning um, of my work. And to me, neuroplasticity is so promising, so hopeful, so optimistic. And it's, it's you know, it's being applied with people with chronic pain, um, you know, people with different mental health issues in my field, uh, learning difficulties. We've used this work with people with addiction. We're just studying, starting a study at Harvard with people with acquired and traumatic brain injury. Mm -hmm. um, it's, I just think, you know, we used to believe this organ was fixed and basically the brain you're born with is a brain you're going to die with and if you have a problem in it nothing you can do now we know that's not the case so mm. uh, i i'm in love with the human brain mm. Mm. thank you for sharing that and like i'm like such a such an honor to to meet you and have you on the show because there's so many people still in today's world who believe that things about them are fixed. And that mm -hmm. this is just how I am, especially when you've heard it since a young age, mm -hmm. you have that you have a stutter or you have, a, you know, you have dyslexia. That's just how it is. Or you have, you know, actually, I'm kind of curious on that. Like, I, I have so many questions. They're like, <laughs> they're, 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 hopefully I can get them all out. But like, what have you seen in turn? Because now you do this, you have your Aerosmith program, like this is like your life's work. And mm -hmm. as much as my heart like hurts for that younger you, I'm, you know, I've definitely learned that very often when we have suffering, if, if thank goodness you had the will and, and your soul and you had the dad that you had and you had, you know, the something in you that mm -hmm. drove to solve that problem. But um, you know, what have you seen in terms of the work that you're doing now? Like, let's say somebody has dyslexia or, you know, your typical like learning disabilities, maybe they're in the learning disabled class. Like what kind of things have you seen now happen that maybe people might not even be aware is possible in today's yeah. world? Yeah, I would say that still in um, most traditional educational systems, the approaches, if you have a learning difficulty, are really what I call compensatory or workaround, right? So they're, okay. they're still the concept, um, and I've met fabulous teachers, and it's not that they aren't doing a really good job, but they're not really taught about neuroplasticity, right? Yeah. So it's, there's still, most of education is working out of what I call the pre-neuroplastic paradigm. The assumptions are still that the learners are like a fixed black box. Right. And the job of education is to fill that box with, with knowledge and skills and strategies. Um, but if there's a challenge with the box, it's, there's not the belief we can actually change the box. The right. idea is to change the external world. So if, you know, the child struggles, um, with writing, give them voice recognition software, right? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it's, it's, it's workarounds or break the task down into smaller components so it's easier to learn. Um, and it's not that there's some value. Those were kind of techniques that were used that allowed me to get through school, um, but they're compensatory and it takes effort mm -hmm. and work. And what we're seeing in the brains, because we've done imaging research of students with learning difficulties, is there parts of the brain that are underperforming or underconnected, and that's where the learning difficulties are. And then the other parts of the brain hyperconnect. 
So you have this brain that's working super hard, these areas that are trying to compensate for the areas of difficulty, but they can't fully do that because they're not designed to do the job of those other areas. So what you have is a brain that's working really, really hard, but not efficiently. And that's what the experience of that child is in the classroom. They're putting in you know, 10, 20, 30 times more effort um, than their peers that don't have the learning difficulties. Mm -hmm. And even with all that effort, they're not getting the same results. And then what happens is often, you know, this concept of rolling brownouts is this idea in the brain, like the brain goes refractory, it gets exhausted. So then mm -hmm. attention wanders, and then you get all the attentional issues that get described, you know, with students with learning difficulties, because they can't put in that amount of effort to try to process or handle the material. And that's exactly what's happening in, in the brain. So, but what I'm seeing is I'm, my work now is in, well, I think we're in 14 countries and we're just going into uh, the 15th country, hopefully in the next month. And educators are really excited about implementing this kind of work because most people get into education because they want to make a difference in children's lives. Um, and this allows them to do that. Like it, it's that they, as soon as they're given the, the tools and techniques um, to transform the capacity of their students, they embrace it and never want to look back. So um, I'd say there's definitely openness, but there isn't the knowledge. I mean, in, in teacher training, they don't really talk about neuroplasticity. If they do, it might be mentioned, you know, in a you know 30 minute segment. Um, mm -hmm. And so my, my passion and commitment is let's put the brain into the education equation. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we have, uh, we're just doing research in Madrid in Spain uh, with students in grades one to six that 30 minutes a day, these are not students with learning difficulties, but 30 minutes a day, they're doing a cognitive exercise five days a week. And we're looking at students that are doing that compared to students that aren't doing it. And we're finding processing speed, attention, nice all sorts of cognitive abilities are changing. It's, you know, you go to school to learn, you learn with your brain, let's stimulate the brain along with learning curriculum. So mm. uh, I'm, I'm very committed. And, you know, in the first edition of my book, that was, you know, I ended it with my vision and I thought I'm never going to see this in my lifetime. Right. And there are multiple schools now that are, are doing this. Nice. So I'm encouraged. I'm really encouraged. Mm. You know, I think belief is such an important aspect of this conversation. Um, I had a woman on this podcast a couple years ago, and she was a, um, what do they call it? Uh, shoot, like the, when you do ski tricks, you do ski jumps and you do all the tricks uh -huh. in the Olympics of I can't remember, but she had a massive brain injury. She almost died. She was completely paralyzed. I told her she never walked again, all that stuff. And her mom was a big believer in neuroplasticity. And so was she, and she, she described the process of being able to even control her body again, as mm -hmm. like, as though there was uh, snow packed taller than you and you're trying to forge a path mm -hmm. through it. Like it's, she was like, it's not easy. I'm not trying to say like, you're just gonna like, boom, yay, I can do it now, you know, <laughs> but she had the belief that she could, you know, and I think that, that you getting out on podcasts and writing your book and just opening these conversations is so helpful because if you just believe that you can't train your brain, you know, like, I mean, that's what you were told is like, this is just how you are. There's nothing you can do about it. And then you heard about this professor at Berkeley, like, what is he doing? Wait, what? This is possible. It sounds to me like that belief in, in your TED talk, you talk about how you read the first page of a book and like actually understood it. And soon you had a hundred books around you, like just checking to see if you could read a page of that book and that book and that book, you know, and yeah. I think it's such yeah. a beautiful image of, uh, like you discovering like, this is possible. Like I can actually do this. So can you talk about belief in terms of retraining your brain and what you've seen there? Yeah, I, I think it's really critical. I mean, you know, Carol Dweck's work, growth mindset, you know, it, mm. it's so important. And we have a choice. Like, it's like flipping a switch. I'm not saying it's easy, but you can decide, you know, that I'm fixed and there's nothing I can do about it, or I can change my reality and my experience. And I would just encourage anybody listening, you know, work on flipping that switch. And it's like a muscle. It's a mental muscle that you mm -hmm. just have to work on. And over time, you practice it. And that is what drives neuroplastic change in the brain is, is practice, right? I mean, you can... Mm -hmm. 
you know, it, it's, it, it's, I mean, it sounds simple, but it take it does take effort. I mean, you've got to mm -hmm. make that conscious choice, you know, to change that. And then you have to practice it, but with practice and it, it be, just becomes a new neural pathway and you go down that, that route. Um, and, you know, things change as, as a result of that. So I think it's really critical. And I say that to parents too, that, you know, cause they often are told about their children that just like my mother was that don't have high expectations, don't expect much. This is going to be the mm -hmm. fate of that individual. And, and I say to parents, you know, your children, you know, that's not true because they live with those children. And, you know, the, I say one of the most important things is deeply listen to your child, like listen to what your mm -hmm. child is is telling you um and then work with your child to find a solution and my work is one piece of of the mm -hmm. the puzzle um you know we and often uh, i like what that that person that does the the skiing said um is often we want to look for something that's simple and it would be wonderful like i i would love it if you know i had a little magic wand and i could tap the student on the head and say <laughs> there you go it, it, but you know there's this concept in neuroscience called effortful processing right mm. and to make meaningful change in your brain you, you have to do effort you know to create those new neural pathways mm -hmm. um so you know what i say to people if you want to take an activity that you're engaged in in your life and make it more neuroplastic. There are a few principles. And one is you should pick something that you want to do because you need to engage in it. So if you, if you pick something that you loathe, you probably aren't going to engage. So, you know, you have to actively sustain engagement with the activity and probably around at least like 20 minutes a day. So, you know, you set aside 20 minutes a day, pick something, maybe you want to learn chess or um, ballroom dancing or, or something, mm -hmm. uh, a new language. Um, and then you need to practice it, you know, up to you can do more than 20 minutes, but not really less than, than 20 minutes. But you need to calibrate the level of difficulty. So let's say I wanted to learn French. And if I start at, you know, advanced university French, <laughs> I'm not going to be successful. But maybe if I start at, you know, kindergarten French, it'll be too easy. You have to look at where you're currently functioning and you have to make the level that you're engaging with just slightly more difficult, kind of like physical mm -hmm. exercise. Like right. if you went to the gym and decided I'm going to lift two pounds and that's all I'm going to lift, you know, for 10 reps, is that really going to change anything? So mm -hmm. you've got to find out, you know, where's that sweet spot where there's effort for processing. Nice. And then as you master, because, you know, you whatever you've picked, you master and become proficient in it. Um, then your brain's kind of on cruise control, which is kind of fun. But then you have to step up the level of difficulty. So it's that that, you know, you you calibrate the level of difficulty slightly above where you're currently functioning easily. You master that. Then you step up the level of difficulty a bit more. You master that and you step up the level of difficulty. And I guarantee you, you're going to drive change in your brain um, that will be meaningful and significant. Um, so again, if you want to change your mindset, you know, pick something that you really want to change and start like calibrate, like, you know, it's, it's, you know, what is the first small step that you can take towards doing that and then master that and then pick the next step. Like it's, it's the same kind of principle. And then eventually you will have a growth mindset and, and be um, open to, to change. So mm -hmm. I just encourage, like, you don't need to go to, you know, my program to do that. You can just add that into your your daily, you know, your daily routines and practice. And then if there's a learning difficulty, then that's where, you know, my work um, specializes or a traumatic brain injury um, mm -hmm. where, you know, there's something that's that's um, challenging within in the wiring of the brain that needs to be mm -hmm. uh, rectified. I love this. It, um, you know, because I do health coaching and mindset coaching for a living and, and I'm working with just behavior change so much of it. Um, it really resonates with me what your dad said about 
what did you say? Understand the nature of the problem. Yes. How he phrased it. I love that because that requires you to be the observer that requires you to, let's say you've noticed you have road rage tendencies, right? <laughs> At first you have to, it's, it's helpful to observe like what is going on here? You know, like what, and you want to get past that. And then you're going to have to be like, Oh, I've noticed that when I'm rushed, cause I left too late, I go into victim mode and I start blaming everything outside of me. I'm noticing that I'm noticing that. And then to actually change it, you're going to have to like progressively change your behavior in the moment of somebody cuts you off or somebody's going 10 miles an hour and you're running late. It's like, here it is. What mm. am I going to do instead? Okay. I'm this time I'm going to practice. Maybe the first time I'm going to get really frustrated and then I'm going to go into breath. You know, I'm going to start breathing deep. Right. Yeah. And then it, it, that repetition over and over, like what you're talking about with changing your brain patterns just reminds me so much of any type of behavior change. Mm -hmm. It's going to take repetition. It's going to take awareness and keep repeating and slowly enhancing that to you, the point where you're now in a different space when you're driving. Right. So it applies to every aspect of our life, but I, I just wanted to really highlight what your dad said. Cause I love that so much is really because understanding the nature of the re problem requires a neutral energy. Mm -hmm. Right. And very often I find with these things, we get into like frustration or victimization or anger or like, oh, I just mm -hmm. can't, or I can't change it. But when you go into it, let me understand the nature of this. It immediately zooms you out into this observer role mm -hmm. where you can actually start to make change. So anyway, I just absolutely yeah. love that. I firm believer, like in the observer witness, it, it's, mm -hmm. it's very, very neutral. Um, mm -hmm place and then you can you can observe and is and get deeply into what is it that that's happening and then change it and that's what again I say to parents is you know when I talk about that deeply listen it's really yeah. just observe and 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 see your child right instead mm. of you know layering on all these expectations like yeah. you know you know, if you really listen to children, they're pretty good at telling you, you know, what they need or what their challenges are. Um, and then you can work with them to find solutions to their problem. And again, I say to parents, like, never give up, always like advocate for your child. And if a teacher says, you know, no, that's not possible, then go somewhere else and look somewhere else. Because mm -hmm. there, there's so much that we're still learning about, you know, about the brain, about learning. Um, you know, to me, that's why I love my work. I'm constantly learning, um, you know, more and more and more about this, you know, the power of the brain. Um, all over the place, right? Like in, in terms of not just learning, but mental health, um, you know, the work that we did with the addiction was, uh, you know, incredibly powerful. We also see as um, students free up cognitive resources by strengthening those areas of weakness, we see creativity open up. And I, mm. I wouldn't have expected that, but it, I mean, it makes mm. sense. I sit back and think about it because if, if you're having to spend so much energy in your brain uh, to support those areas of difficulty, you have no energy left over to right. do anything. You free right. up energy and it can go in wow. you know, creative, you know, directions. I mean, we've had opera singers, um, you know, jazz mm. people, uh, people that write lyrics, you know, and, and poetry that just all starts to open up because this, this energy is, is, mm -hmm. you know, yeah, which I'm sure you see in your work as well, that, you know, they're, I call them like the things that, that, that drain energy yeah. and the difficulty certainly drains energy out of the brain. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I mean, we notice often in the, you know, mindset life coaching role that when somebody's in pure survival mode, mm -hmm. like they're just trying to survive the day, get the kids home from work, you know, make food, like bathe them, go to sleep, wake up next. It's really hard to be creative and, and think, Hmm, I wonder, you know, what would I like to bring to the world when you're in survival mode in your right. life. So it makes sense that when your brain is in survival mode, it's like, it's just trying to function, just trying to barely get there. You're not yes. going to have access to that. So it's like, first, let's, the first step is, okay, how can we start solving these other issues wow. so that you're out of survival mode before we can be like, I wonder what I want to bring to the world. You know, <laughs> maybe I'll play the trombone. Like <laughs> it's not going to happen really when you're just barely making it, you know? Okay. Yeah, exactly. And and one of the other things that, you know, 
again, you know, in retrospect, makes sense. But, you know, we have a lot of students that come into the program around the world that are on um, stimulant medication, like medication yeah. for potential issues. And, you know, I mean, that's that's a choice that people make. I'm not anti-medication, but we find as students go through the program, about 75 percent of them can come off the medication, obviously. Wow with uh, with their doctors. Um, but because, again, the brain is now not having that what I call the cognitive load, it's not having to work so hard, you know, and then it gets exhausted, because now those those areas can function normally, wow. efficiently. Um, so they don't need the medication to focus attention, or we have programs for the prefrontal cortex, which is, you know, executive function. And part of its job is regulating goal oriented attention. So it's the part of the brain that says, I've got this problem to solve here. These are the kind of things that I, I need to focus on to solve that problem. And then if a distraction comes up, you know, you might get distracted momentarily, but it's the part of the brain that brings you back mm -hmm. to be goal oriented. And mm -hmm. as part of the brain is strengthened, they don't need medication to regulate attention. So um, again, you know, our brain is designed to allow us to function and adapt in the world. And if there's something not working, we can just make it work. And there should be no stigma. You know, I mean, if somebody has diabetes, you know, maybe they need insulin. There's no stigma around, you know, we just have to find what is a thing that we need to, uh, you know, allow this organ, our brain to to function in the way is is designed to function, which allows us to engage with the world. You know, if we look at the World Health Organization, their definition of mental health, one of the factors is being able to engage in the world, like be able to participate in the world. Mm. And I can certainly attest from my experience with the learning difficulty, it had a significant impact on my ability to right relate and engage and to a lot of the the individuals we work with and you address that and strengthen it we see things like locus of control shift like they mm -hmm. they feel they have their agents of control in their own lives mm -hmm. um, their sense of happiness mm -hmm. well-being emotional intelligence empathy perspective wow. taking um you know being able to put themselves into somebody else's shoes and understand their experience all of that changes because it's our brain that allows us to have those kinds of experiences and understand them. So it's, it's, um, I find this work very humbling, right? I yeah. mean, I, you know, constantly tell myself, don't make assumptions, right? Because there's so much that we don't understand. And I mm -hmm. learned, you know, so much from the, the students, from the educators, from the parents, um, that, that we work with that, um, it's yeah i mean i just i find the brain uh, one of us our most important assets i think and i think every individual in the world should have the right to enhance that asset given that we have the knowledge now with neuroplasticity and how to harness it that it should just be in every school system so mm -hmm. every individual can can access it Mm. I'm curious, have you worked with, I'm assuming you probably have, but kids on the autism spectrum, and I'm curious what your experience has been with yeah. that. We have with the, the high functioning, you know, like what uh -huh. they called Asperger's, I think uh -huh. they've changed the, the yeah. technology, um, but you know, that, that high functioning where, you know, they're awkward socially, they, they struggle to navigate the social world uh, they can't read social cues. And we've had a lot of success because I have a program for the right prefrontal cortex, which mm. is that part of the brain that, that interprets um, nonverbal information, mm. uh, allows the individual to understand social nuance, social relations. Um, and also in some cases, there's sort of uh, that um, thinking that's sort of rigid, you know, that it's, right. it's either this or that, there's no kind of gray area in between. And we have a program that that was one of my problems, you know, mm -hmm. I might have been identified as, you know, a little bit on the spectrum, you know, in my early mm -hmm. years, but I didn't have that diagnosis. So I didn't get it. Mm -hmm. um, but I had the black and white or the rigid, the very rigid thinking, I was very stubborn, um, because I didn't understand my world. So I, I held on for dear life, mm -hmm. for the little that I did understand, and nobody was going to tell me differently. Um, mm -hmm. So definitely, those two exercises, those two parts of the brain uh, have a significant um, positive benefit with that mm -hmm. population. You know, what I would say is the individual who worked with, they're still quirky and unique, 
However, they can relate and navigate much better in the social world and they're much happier because, you know, they, they can develop um, deep and positive social relationships. Mm. So, so yes, we've, we've had that group. Okay. Thanks. And then I'm curious about your work with addiction. What's that been uh, bringing about, you know, what's your experience there? Yeah, so we're working with an organization that's in uh, Australia in uh, Teen Challenge. They're around the world, but we're working with the group in uh, in Queensland in uh, Australia. And it's a treatment program for young adults, uh, males and females. And we're using the, the exercise, the first one that I created for myself, that, that again allows you to 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 reason, have insight. So if you have a difficulty in this area, insight is really challenging. I, I could never have benefited from being in therapy because I couldn't connect things. I couldn't see mm-hmm. if this happens, then that happens, like the cause and effect. Um, and so obviously mm-hmm. that's really important if you're in treatment to a you know, rehabilitation program to recover from addiction. Part of what you need to do is therapy, right? To exactly what you talked about, understand you know, what your triggers are, what led you to this. And if they have that difficulty, which, you know, the brain gets rewired in addiction um, Mm. and often this area is impacted. Mm. So we worked on that area and they could do things like uh, they had insight, they developed insight, you know, they were much more able to benefit from the therapeutic process. So again, it was one piece of of the treatment puzzle. Um, They a lot of them had had learning difficulties, you know, going through school. They were now. I think the average age was about 30. Um, and so they'd had a whole history of, you know, what that struggle was. And so, you know, that was addressed. They could engage, they could understand things, they could read, comprehend, um, you know, again, engage. I got a beautiful painting that one of them sent me of a duckbill platypus because um, he started painting mm-hmm. again. Another went back to poetry. So, mm-hmm very similar to what we see with students with with learning difficulties but it it gave um these individuals the cognitive resources to benefit from the therapeutic process um and engage in other rewarding behaviors and not the addictive behaviors mm. because again, that that those resources were freed up in in the brain mm. to um see things differently to engage with the world differently and to develop you know um better social relations. So really um, encouraging. And we're continuing that study. Uh, We're going to finish in sort of the end of March, and then we'll have sufficient uh, number of individuals. We'll continue the treatment program, but the research part uh, will be done. And our goal is to publish. And and then I'd like to work with more people with addiction. Um, I I think part of what this work does is it alleviates human suffering, that if, if something is not working in your brain, it in many cases causes suffering because you feel that you don't fit in and you struggle. And we do see a number of students with learning difficulties that self-medicate, right? Because right. And they're trying to numb the pain. Um, so it made sense that a number of these students in this program also had learning difficulties. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But if, you know, I, and I had the privilege of going to um, visit them, uh, I can't remember whether it was in 2022, I think, um, and actually hear their stories. And it was just, it was very profound. That's the favorite part of my job is when I go to actually meet the students that are in the program and hear their stories and hear their transformation. And that's what, um, you know, keeps me motivated. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, imagine, I imagine a lot of people are self-medicating because they find that when they use that substance, possibly they feel like that part of their brain might be working a little better where they're lacking, right. Which is going to make them want to keep using it. But eventually when there's all this negative fallout, (laughs) you know, it's like, it's what a gift if you can just get that to start working Mm -hmm. without relying on a substance that causes a lot of negative fallout in your life. So really cool. Thank you for sharing that. And, um, I was curious, you know, for the people listening, um, I don't, I don't know if you have thoughts on this, but things that um, negatively impact neuroplasticity in everyday life for kids yeah. or adults, and then vice versa, some things they can consider to positively impact neuroplasticity. Well, there's so much research now on sleep, right? The, the yeah. 
Yeah. That sleep is really important for our brain. It's important for many aspects of our body, but um, for our brain, I mean, there, there's research looking at, you know, actually when we do sleep, we do consolidate memories. Um, there's some really interesting research and imaging on that, but it's, it's also neuroprotective for our brain. So getting, you know, sufficient amount of sleep is, is really important. And that often is within, in our control exercise, like aerobic exercise is really important. The rule of thumb is if it's good for your heart, it's good for your brain. Nice. Um, again, it's, it's neuroprotective. It generates brain derived neurotrophic factor, which is, um, again, neuroprotective. So, you know, and, and you might, you know, you don't have to, you know, go to a gym, you can go out for a nice brisk walk in nature. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, there are things that are accessible to to anyone. Um, so sleep, exercise, you know, good nutrition, um, you know, eating, uh, you know, healthily is um, is important. Social relations are important. We, I mean, there's a lot of research now, like having good social connections is neuroprotective. Um, so and those are all things that, you know, are within our our control. Um so I'm trying to think whether they're, I mean, those are the, the, the main ones and reducing stress. That's like mindfulness is I forgot that one is um, so important. And again, there's like so much on YouTube or so many free apps that people can engage with. So reducing stress, um, there's research looking at, excuse me, I've just got a little bit of a tickle in my throat Ooh. that, you know, they look at people that meditate and there's this thing called cortical thinning as we age and people that meditate don't get cortical thinning at the same rate as people that don't meditate. Um, <coughs> excuse me. So mindfulness, any kind of mindfulness practice that reduces stress. Yeah. It's oh, important. Yeah. Thanks for sharing that. I, you know, all, everything <laughs> that you just mentioned there has been absolutely profound for me, especially the sleep piece. I understand why you, put that one first. Um, I become quite obsessed with going to bed at the same time and getting up at the same time ish every day. It is quite life-changing. I I've come mm -hmm. to the point where, I, I mean, if you want to mat, you can feel it within days. Like if you go a whole week of going to bed early, getting, giving yourself plenty of time to sleep, like you don't even need an alarm. You just wake up naturally <laughs> and repeat for a whole week. And then you mess that up over the weekend. You stay up till one o'clock and maybe you get up early the next morning. And then the next day you like stay up late again and sleep for like 11 hours. You just see how you feel on that next day. I mean, it is like very obvious. We don't need a study. You can be your study. It's real obvious how much that impacts the functionality of our brain. So I, I love that you put that first. And of course the other ones I'm a fan of and <laughs> what I do for a living. So, um, exactly. Yeah. yeah. Thanks for sharing that. And then in terms of, um, you know, I don't know, like alcohol or, you know, inflammatory foods, um, or I'm trying to think, you know, what are some things that like you in your, I, I don't know if you have any, but do you have anything that you're like, Oh man, this is really going to diminish your ability to have good neuroplasticity? Well, certainly we know inflammation is, is, yeah. Not and it's implicated probably in, um, you know, cognitive decline as we age, um, you know, alcohol mm -hmm. so much research coming out now that, that ideally it's probably better if we, we don't drink at all. It's, it's can be mm -hmm. challenging. Um, you know, but I think definitely, um, avoiding anything that causes inflammation. I mean, stress causes inflammation, right? right? Lack of sleep causes inflammation. Um, the things that we can do that avoid inflammation, we should do because mm -hmm. it's it definitely has a negative impact on multiple organs, including um, the brain. The other thing I forgot is keep your brain active. That's really, yeah. really important. You know, develop that growth mindset. Um, keep challenging your brain. You know, if you find uh, you do things uh, in a routine, like mix up your routine, like novelty, your brain loves novelty, right? Yeah. Like, so, you know, um, even simple things, you know, if you brush your teeth, <clears throat> excuse me, mm, <laughs> your right hand all the time, switch some days and use your left yeah. hand. If you drive the same route all the time, switch the route. Mm. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. 
Totally. Yeah, I must say, you know, here on the <laughs> on oh. the big island of Hawaii where I live, um, there's a lot of ecstatic dance and, you know, just people living very active lives. Like I've met many people in their 70s and they look healthier than many people I know in their 30s out mm -hmm. here. And it's I, it's been such a profound experience. Um, I was talking to my 18 year old daughter about it last night. I'm like, you know what I've learned from the older generation here on the big island if you just keep living, if you just keep using it, you just keep dancing and playing and swimming and all these things. And like, like you get to keep it, use it or lose it, you know? And I just thought of like imagining myself being 70 something and just sitting there on the couch flipping channels all day. I'm like, I would just get stuck. You just get stuck like that yeah. <laughs> eventually, you know? So yeah, I think, um, novelty play, play, you know, and I, they're so socially enriched They're, you know, I thought, man, I hope when I'm 75 or so that I'm still have the energy to come to these dances and play in the ocean. And, you know, it's been really actually quite like an amazing, um, immersion experience for me. It's, it's, it's unusually high num the number of that here in Hawaii, yeah. you know? And so, yeah, just a push for that, like use it or lose it, go play, have fun, yeah. try new things. <laughs> exactly. Well, that, and that's, um, Dio Hebb, who was one of the early neuroscientists. That was one of his things talked about use it or lose it. Like mm. neurons wire together, wire together. Yeah. So yeah. Is. Keep engaged, keep active, mm. keep your brain active, go a different way, do something different. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. Well, thank you so much, Barbara. Can you share with people how they can partake? I mean, obviously we'll link up your, your website and your book. Um, and, but it, you know, can you tell people a little bit more about like how they, somebody listening to this could partake of what you have to offer? Yeah. So I would say our website is probably our biggest resource and we list providers like where the work is around the world. But one of the benefits of COVID is we were forced to go online because we were in physical schools all around the world. And all of a sudden those doors shut and we had students that we still needed to provide the program. So we developed software that and we've done research to show that our online deliveries are getting the same results as our in person. So we have lots of options. So I would say, you know, our website, aerosmith.ca. Um, check it out. And we have webinars, like we have a lot of information. Uh, we have our research there, um, you know, webinars on, you know, enhancing our brain, you know, the power of our brain. Um, and you can always reach out and email us right as well. And we love questions. So um, please come and engage with us. Thank you. And yeah, if there's any educators listening, you have a section on there for educators and mm -hmm. programs for schools. So if that appeals to anyone, definitely check that out. And we'll link up your TED Talk too. And you know, if you know anyone who has a learning disability in any way, shape, or form, send them her TED Talk. You're, you know, it's it's to the point, it's profound, it's impacting. So I'll link that in the show notes as well. And yeah, Barbara, wow. Like, look what you did. Look what you did. <laughs> It's so amazing. Thank you so much for showing up for yourself and then for so many others. And thank you for coming and sharing with us today. My pleasure. Thank you. Thank you.